children growing thin because of formaldehyde and calf brains pureed together and labeled milk. Formaldehyde, arsenic, <laughs> and, and the big one is cyanide. Candies dyed with heavy metals like tin and lead. Metallic dyes, oh, maggots and butter and milk, animal stomachs. Soldiers being rewarded for their service with meat so saturated with toxins, it's called embalmed beef. The uh, pureed calf brains, that's, and formaldehyde is another one. American food wasn't always what it is today. At the turn of the 20th century, thousands died because no governing body controlled what manufacturers put in their foods. Every grocery store was full of toxic products. Doctors around the country complained of seeing too many children starved and slender. Mothers coast to coast shed tears, wondering why their families were dying, not knowing they were serving them acids with every mealtime. American foods were banned in Europe because they began to kill international citizens. It was New York journalist John Mulally that vocalized the cry echoing from every American home. Where are the police? As the 1800s turn into the 1900s, American food experiences a transition. On the back end of the Industrial Revolution, food is no longer being manufactured on farms, but in factories. People in Oregon can buy products made in Texas. Families welcome new, edible brands they've never seen before. Underneath, however, there is a crisis. By 1902, the United States is the only developed country on Earth without federal food safety laws, and American citizens are paying the price. Candy manufacturers are using new, brighter dyes made from lead, tin, and copper. Beef manufacturers realize they can pump their products full of formaldehyde, an embalming fluid, to keep it from rotting, and maybe spice it with copper sulfate for color. Formaldehyde, I mean, that stuff that we use post-mortem to fix um, tissue, so ha digesting that while you're alive isn't going to be healthy for your body. Chicken manufacturers realized they could dye cow stomachs to look like poultry. Open a spice cabinet and one could find sand, dirt, coconut shells, rope, coal, seashells, and insects, all crushed together, charred for color, and labeled as anything from cinnamon to allspice. Dairy farmers were among the worst. Milk's new recipe consisted of water, plaster, chalk, fat, and pureed calf brains for color. Men consumed what they believed to be a fine aged whiskey, but was instead isopropyl alcohol and salicylic acid dyed brown. Young kids paid for a drink at a soda fountain and could be served a cola chock full of lithium, caffeine, or cocaine. Counterfeit food had been sold for so long, a generation of youth were beginning to believe the foods they ate were supposed to taste like bleach and acid. It is an American tragedy, manufacturers duping and killing a generation of citizens. The problem caught the eye of a stout chemist named Dr. Harvey Wiley. Wiley was a medical doctor turned chemist from Harvard who became Purdue's first professor of chemistry. He was known to be stubborn, orthodox, and he became engrossed in the topic of food safety. His Indiana lab was devoted to searching out toxins in food, and he was appalled at what he found. In the late 1870s, Wiley struck the honey industry. His tests had discovered that more than 90% of all honey was a fake. Most of his samples were just corn syrup. The doctor made the comment that, as of late, there had been beekeepers who had not bothered keeping bees. It was his devotion to the cause that, in 1882, got him the job of chief chemist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Thus began a three-decade witch hunt for second-rate food. Close to the turn of the century, American stomachs had been sickened by the first nationwide food crisis. In 1899, there convened the Beef Court, a hearing focused on beef shipped from Chicago meatpacking companies to American soldiers in Cuba during the Spanish-American War a year earlier. The troops complained of canned beef that reeked of embalming fluid and tasted like preservatives. Wiley discussed how his Department of Agriculture lab had flagged all sorts of preservatives in the meat, boric acid, salicylic acid, sulfites, and saltpeter, a component of gunpowder. Men who had fought in Cuba told the story of a young soldier who had died of lead poisoning. The lead solder that held together the gans had seeped into his body. The meat packers, Libby McNeil and Libby, Armour, and Kudahe claimed innocence. They blamed disease, Cuban heat, and lack of spices for the taste and appearance. The court sided with them. By the 1900s, over 190 laws addressing food manufacturing had been introduced into Congress, all of which had failed. 
The main reason was simple. Congress acknowledged that Wiley and other labs had discovered levels of preservatives in food, but no one actually knew at what levels they were safe. Chemical companies were synthesizing new preservatives at high rates, and Congress could not ban or restrict them because safe levels had not been discovered. The problem was a thorn in Wiley's side. No matter how many times he and his chemists detected foreign ingredients in food, Congress would not act. So, in 1902, the doctor decided to take on the issue in an odd way. He hired the personal chef of the Queen of Bavaria and 12 healthy young male government workers. They all signed waivers. It was a simple trade. Wiley would feed the men three square meals a day, delightfully cooked. In turn, they would undergo a series of daily tests. Urine, blood, hair, weight, temperature, and more. The catch? At any given time, half of the men were devouring poisoned meals. Wiley started with borax. He called his experiments the Hygienic Table Trials. A Washington Post reporter gave it a much more colorful name, the Poison Squad. News of old borax and his Poison Squad spread like wildfire. Newspapers reported on it daily. The men were given songs and became celebrities. They even had their own slogan, None but the brave dare eat the fair. Over the course of four years, Wiley tried out seven poisons on a host of men. He was appalled at the results. It took just days for the subjects to suffer nausea, diarrhea, kidney and liver problems. The toxins showed up in their blood, urine, and even hair. It was 1906 when Wiley presented his research to Congress and then President Teddy Roosevelt, and the Pure Food and Drug and Meat Inspection Acts were passed. Roosevelt had been spurred on by his reading of The Jungle, a novel by investigative journalist Upton Sinclair. The story follows a Lithuanian immigrant's life as he works in the Chicago packing yards. He accounts uh, workers falling into the rendering tanks and being ground up into this leaf lard that's then going into pies and pastries. It was a triumph that the 1906 bills had been passed, but enforcement was the real struggle. Most state governments were waist deep in manufacturers' money. Bribes, lobbying, and payments were common. It took more hard work on Wiley's part to enact action. He worked inside the industries, creating propaganda, as well as in the public eye at events like World Fairs. But the most important work was done in court, where Wiley presented evidence to punish hundreds of companies. He brought the ceiling down on flour manufacturers who were bleaching their product. He fought the meat packers on their factory conditions. In one of his most important cases, he fought Coca-Cola in the Supreme Court. The company had been manufacturing a hazardous beverage. It was shown people were consuming upwards of 15 drinks daily, and each Coke had over twice the amount of caffeine they do today. Wiley argued for strict warning labels. In the end, the judges decided caffeine cutbacks were enough. Wiley fought long and hard for more than three decades in the government, but finally he felt he could do no more good. He resigned in 1912, and the nation was devastated. He received several letters, but the nation's reaction is best summed up by the Washington Star, who simply sent him a comic. It was Uncle Sam staring at two shoes labeled Dr. Wiley. They were massive, too large for anyone to possibly fit. Wiley took up a position at Good Housekeeping magazine. There he had his own lab and tested hundreds of foods and cosmetics, as well as kept his own magazine column. He published cookbooks, advising housewives on how to do their own testing in the kitchen. Wiley's three-decade career was more than instrumental to food safety. The Department of Chemistry at the Department of Agriculture, which he founded, was later restructured and renamed the FDA. As for the hundreds of men that put their lives on the line in the Poison Squad, very little is known about them. We know that one was in high school. We know some were in college. We don't know any of their names. But we do know more than half died younger than expected. Kidney failure and jaundice are among the leading causes. It is a triumph that their efforts succeeded, but it is a tragedy that they died unknown. But furthermore, it's a tragedy that the Poison Squad experiments were ever necessary. The story of early American food manufacturing is a blight on American history. The Poison Squad members represent few of the thousands of Americans that died at the hand of poisoned food. And yet the triumph shines through, the legacy widely left behind in the FDA, the Pure Food and Drug Act, and nutritional labels. So the next time you bake a warm pie, or slice into a delicious steak, give thanks to the stiff chemist who sacrificed his career, and the horde of men who sacrificed their lives, so every American had the right to a quality meal.